Thank you, Neil. And I want to thank um, all of you for coming, for Chard, Chard and Drew, and everybody at Sundog for making this happen, and Ellen for her beautiful reading. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to go after Ellen. Can you hear me all right? Um, I'm going to switch my glasses. People have been telling me to get progressives. Last night at dinner was almost like an intervention. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to read, my newest book is not that new, uh, 2020, so I'm going to sort of mix in some newer poems. Um, and this one is uh, set in the Adirondacks uh, on a lake. Um, Alexandria yesterday was t talking about how she likes to write about lakes, so do I. This might be the only one I'm reading today. Um, it's called Laps. Not until the next day when we saw the haze veiling the lake, softening the mossy greens of the mountains on the far shore. And really, not until we picked up the paper at the general store and found the page of maps tracking vast plumes of smoke across the continent, did we catch the ashy odor and grasp that wildfires thousands of miles away accounted for the beauty of the moon we'd thoughtlessly admired the night before, the shape and color of a mango hanging weightless in the sky. That was several years ago. Now when that happens, we know exactly what it is, unfortunately. Um, this next poem is about the um, Norwegian painter Nikolai Astrup. Um, who isn't that well known, but is a little bit better known than he was a few years ago because there was a, a show at the, the Clark that some of you may have seen like maybe two years ago. And um, he was famous in Norway. I mean, uh, Edvard Munch owned some of his paintings. Um, he's got this very vivid, um, magical uh, style, um, almost pagan at times. It's called Raw Colors. For him, the glistening streams running down the mountainsides still sang the ancient songs, although less audibly than during his childhood, when, to escape the gloom indoors, he climbed under the turf roof, thick with grass and shrubs, to pick raspberries under the cloud-animated sky. The mountains encircled him like elders less stern than his father, the pastor, who warned him that whatever gave him pleasure was a sin, even sledding, and later painting. He wanted to wash himself in the region's raw colors and apply them untainted to his paintings and woodcuts. The lake's cobalt, red splash of rowan berries, copper glow of a mountain's dome at midnight, and for the valleys in spring, his poisonous greens. Anything that hadn't been there when he was a boy, he left out. And what had vanished, he added back in, the drained marshes yellow with marigolds again. He kept returning to a birch grove like a recurring dream where two of his daughters wearing crimson dresses picked mushrooms, bending down in unison as though bowing to the stream rushing by as the foxgloves looked on. Even the boulder topped with moss and frosted with lichen was alive. And the bonfire on Midsummer's Eve was a god of flame leaping high into the violet sky, its great plume of smoke snaking over the valley while the revelers danced on the mountain's green shoulder. And he watched from the edge and took it all in, feeling the heat of the fire on his face. One thing I forgot to say at the beginning is one great thing about this festival is that it, it just shows people how many different things uh, poetry can do. Like with all the different people that we've heard, it's kind of amazing. Um, okay, this is one of those poems that I do sometimes where you see something amazing and want to describe it. Um, I don't do that as much as I used to. And then you want to see where the poem goes after that. This one is kind of foolhardy because it's trying to describe something kind of undescribable, which is an effect of light on a marsh in the evening when um, the light was going down 
all the blades of all the thousands of blades of grass. It's also one sentence, which is, makes it a little hard to read. And there's a parenthetical that I'm not sure will show up as a parenthetical. <laughs> the light in the marsh grass was alive. Small creatures aglow and crawling one after the other down each tall green blade, thousands of them bending at all angles along the quaggy edge of the salt marsh cove the three of us had paddled our kayaks into. Luminous bits of green gold sliding down the myriad stalks, but inside them, as if the marsh were sucking down the warm light through innumerable living straws, drop after drop in a wavering, steady, mesmerizing rhythm. And for once, no explanation we could think of. That unseen ripples on the cove's mirrory stillness focused the late sunlight and Ely ribbons that scrolled down the blades of Spartina could diminish the marvel we had chanced upon. And we gave up trying to explain it, gave ourselves to it, as if we had ingested some hallucinogen that opened our eyes to what was there all along, but had gone unnoticed, each of us in our own pod of selfhood, floating on the fetid primordial cove, now held together in odd suspension by these grasses a swarm with lights that also flowed in waves through us, wanting it not to stop, asking ourselves why we'd never seen what had been going on for eons, asking how we could keep it, knowing we could not. Um, Kate Marvin read a poem yesterday about ripping violets out of the ground and um, and that's not all it was about, but it, I wasn't going to read this poem, but it, it made me think of this poem of mine called Cross Fertilization. I got obsessed a few years ago, well, actually maybe 10 years ago, with trying to get the foxgloves that grow wild in the Adirondacks to, I, try, I was transplanting them in Massachusetts, and they're biennial, so if they don't go to seed, you don't get more foxgloves. So, um, so that's what this, where this came from. Cross fertilization. It's come to this. I'm helping flowers have sex. <laughs> Crouching down on one knee to insert a Q-tip into one freckled foxglove bell after another without any clue as to what I'm doing. Which, come to think of it, is always true the first time with sex. <laughs> and soon Randy Newman's early song, Maybe I'm Doing It Wrong, is running through my head as I fumble and probe, golden pollen tumbling off the swab. I transported these foxgloves from upstate New York, where they grow wild, to our backyard in Massachusetts, and I want them to multiply, but the bumblebees, their main pollinators, haven't found them, and I'm not waiting around. <laughs> the only diagram I found online portrayed a flower in cross-section, the stamens extending the loaded anthers toward the flared opening, but the text explained the female sexual organs are hidden. Of course they are. <laughs> Which leaves me in the dark, transported back to a state of awkward, if ardent, unenlightenment, a complete beginner, figuring it out as I go along, giggling a little and humming an old song as I stick the Q-tip into another flower as if to light the pilot of a gas stove with a kitchen match, leaning in to listen for the small, quick gasp that comes when the flame makes contact with the source. <laughs> oh, whoa. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm gonna read a couple of poems about other poets um, uh, uh, since we're at a festival. This is. Uh, called A Message from Tony Hoagland. I got an email from Tony just now, though he's been dead for a year and a half. And in the instant before my rational brain told me it was spam, I felt the thrill of seeing his name pop up in my inbox, the dopamine rush that he was writing me from beyond the grave. And when I clicked on his name to open the message, the body of the email consisted only of my first name, followed by an exclamation mark, as though he was excited to be writing me. And under that, a compressed link 
in the electric blue that indicated it was live. My giddy finger slid the cursor over it to see what Tony was sending me. Maybe instead of infecting my computer with malware that would harvest my data and require me to pay a huge ransom in cryptocurrency, <laughs> the link would take me to a web page where I could find all the poems Tony has written since he died. I paused a moment and thought about what those poems would be like, but my imagination failed me. Then I clicked delete and went into my trash and deleted the message again which made me feel timid and puny, as though, like D.H. Lawrence and his snake, I'd missed my chance with one of the lords of life. I don't know, some of you know that Tony also has a poem about D.H. Lawrence, so that's sort of a reference to that, too. Okay, this, this poem was um, inspired by a dream that I had about my undergraduate teacher, the poet Kenneth Koch, and it's called Amnesia. In my dream, someone mentioned Kenneth Koch's great poem, Amnesia. I don't remember that when I said, but suddenly, as though projected on the air, I could see the first few lines. I decided to go home and find the rest of the poem, but couldn't remember where home was. When I woke up, of course, I was home, but I didn't remember those lines from the poem. And when I looked through Kenneth's books, I didn't find a poem called Amnesia, or even to Amnesia, one of his odes, which might have begun, I'm sorry I forgot to write a poem about you until now. <laughs> Remembering that the internet remembers everything, supposedly, I googled Kenneth Koch plus Amnesia and found a poem entitled Amnesia in the online magazine Jacket by the Australian poet John Kinsella, but dedicated to Kenneth Koch. Weird. Was I still dreaming? No. I liked the poem, but couldn't help thinking it wasn't quite as much fun as Kenneth Koch's amnesia would be. A, po a poem that exists only in my dream, or wherever dreams go when you wake up. A poem whose first few lines I briefly knew, but can't retrieve though I can picture him writing it in his headlong scrawl, and I won't forget that in my dream, someone, though I can't remember who, called it great, unforgettable. <laughs> um, okay, this is another dream poem, but it's really different. Um, I have half a book about my brother's suicide, and I have another half a book in a different book about my father's death and my relationship with my father. And I, I'm not really going to read any of those, but they both appear in this poem, which is pretty short, actually. It's called Double Visitation. There I was with my father again, alive, walking around the backyard together. And I hardly noticed that it wasn't our backyard or that he looked like he was in his 50s. We were laughing at something, joking around, each comment making us laugh even harder. But then he was crying and I didn't know why, his face contorted, unable to speak. I turned and hugged him and whispered in his ear the words I wanted to say and he wanted to hear. And as if I had uttered some magic formula, I found myself in a movie theater beside my suddenly alive again brother. The movie ended, and as the credits rolled, we both agreed that it was good. Then I said, but I think I fell asleep for part of it, and started telling him the dream I had had, how our father had visited from the dead, and what I'd done, and to show him, did again, whispering those same words to my brother. I forgot to look at the clock when I started. That, that always happens to me. Um, but. I, I'm nearing the end, so don't worry. Um, maybe two more. Uh, this is called Listening to Virginia. It's about listening to, to the lighthouse while driving around in my car. And also, um, uh, the, the reader was named Virginia, too, which was weird. Virginia Leishman. It's a really great recording. Listening to Virginia. 
Driving around, driving around town doing errands, I almost have to pull to the side of the road because I can't go on another minute without seeing the words of some gorgeous passage in the paperback I keep on the passenger seat. But I resist that impulse and keep listening until it is almost Wolf herself sitting beside me like some dear great aunt who happens to be a genius telling these stories in a voice like sparkling waves and following eddies of thought into the mind of other people sitting around a dinner table or strolling under the trees, pulling me along in the current of her words like a twig riding a stream around boulders and down foaming cascades, getting drawn into a whirlpool of consciousness and sucked, and sucked under, swirling into the thoughts of someone else swimming for a while among the reeds and glinting minnows before breaking free and popping back up to the surface, only to discover that in my engrossment, I've overshot the grocery store and have to turn around. <laughs> and even after I'm settled in the parking lot, I can't stop but sit there with the car idling because now she is going over it all again, though differently this time, with new details or from inside the mind of someone else as if each person were a hive with his own murmurs and stirrings that we visit like bees. Sorry, like, sorry, as if each person were a hive with its own murmurs and stirrings that we visit like bees haunting its dark compartments but reaching only so far, never to the very heart, the queen's chamber where the deepest secrets are stored and only there to truly know another person. Though the vibration and the dance of the worker bees tell us something, give us something we can take with us as we fly back out into honeyed daylight. Um, and I think I'll end with another poem about a work of art. It's a um, painting by Gary, Win uh, sorry, a photograph by Gary Winogrand from 1960 that shows a young woman coming toward the viewer, um, crossing a street in New York City. Um, and I think the rest is described in the poem. It's called Girl Carrying a Suitcase. Younger in the photo than my daughter is now, 18 or 19, the same age as my wife when I first met her. She would now be not quite old enough to be my mother more like an older cousin I saw only in summer and would steal glimpses of or find ways to be near. Just as I kept circling back to this girl's photograph at the exhibition to study again the way her body bent slightly to the right to offset the weight of her fabric-covered suitcase against the lighter raffia bag in her other hand. The tapered cut of her sleeveless dress printed with black-eyed Susans, one centered over a breast, and the way her silver bracelets gathered at her, gather at her wrists below the almost dimples on the inside of her elbows, the photos shadowed foci. And since bringing home the postcard I bought at the museum shop, I've been searching her image like a figure recovered from my own past, Someone I almost recognize, though her head is veiled in glare and her hair coming loose from her braids conceals the right side of her face. She gazes downward toward the sidewalk she has just stepped onto from the busy crosswalk, unhurried and alone amid the crowd of the city she is either leaving or returning to, but not arriving in for the first time. She is too unguarded, lost in herself, thinking perhaps of whoever she has just been staying with or is about to visit, someone who, whether cousin, friend, parent, or lover, must surely adore her. If only I could find her and show her this photograph, which almost certainly she has never seen since it was printed for the first time only recently, decades after the photographer's death, or at least send her this postcard I've been keeping on my desk these last few weeks, giving this stolen glimpse of her past back to her, so she too might be taken by this young woman who was once herself, like someone held dear who left long ago, then one late afternoon shows up at the door. Thank you. Thank you.